Well, good evening, my dear brothers and sisters and my young people. We uh, certainly are happy to be with you this evening. We really wish we could have been there in person, as I'm sure all of us wish this at Schiffensburg this year. But we certainly are thankful for the provision we have of doing the best we can under the circumstances and being able to meet, um, as we call it, virtually. So we can still enjoy fellowship around the word. And the interesting thing is, while the world is shut out of much of its activities, we do have the ability to share the word of God together. And so we bring with you the love and greetings of our brothers and sisters in Brantford, and certainly my sister, wife Charlene. Uh, we're very happy to be with you uh, this evening as we consider this subject. And what we're going to be looking at this week, God willing, um, through these series of classes is the subject of the mark of the beast, and it's, it's in uh, contrast to the seal of God. And it really formed part of a greater part of a theme that runs through the Bible. And this theme, of course, is that that we find in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, where we read there that God would put enmity between thee, which is the serpent, and the woman. And those are the two uh, parts there that are hostile one to another. Between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so we see that that is the, the grand theme that runs all the way through the Bible. And it really comes down into the book of Romans, and Paul delineates it here, that there are two ways of thinking. There is the mind of the flesh, which we read of in Romans chapter 8, verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, he goes on to say, because the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile or enmity to God, for it does not submit to God's law, and indeed it cannot. So that's the one side. And the other side, of course, is that mind of the spirit. Romans 8, verse 5, again, those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. And they set upon, uh, to be set, to have a mind set upon the, the spirit or to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And so this is the great contrast that's going to run all the way through our discussion this week is these two seeds, these two mindsets that are going to be contrasted one against another. So we'd like to come to the book of Revelation, where we are introduced to this concept of the seal, although we're going to see that it goes right back into the Bible. In Revelation chapter 7, we have here this picture that's given to us of this whole scene that's unraveling. So it's a dramatic scene in Revelation that introduces us to the symbol that we hope to consider tonight, or at least one of them, uh, the seal of the living God. And we have here in verse two, an angel that ascends from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cries with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. And we're gonna come back and consider them uh, in a later class saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And so that's the process that's going on. The mission of this angel is sealing the servants of God in their foreheads. Now, what we'd like to do is kind of just follow that through. So if you've got your Bible open, and I hope you do, to Revelation chapter 7, just look down and see there in verse 9 um, what we find there is this result. In verse 9, after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the, the throne and before the Lamb, and they're clothed with white robes and palms are in their hands. So this is the result of the sealing process that is going on. And we ask the question, well, who is this group that we are dealing with here? And if you just scan down to verse 13 across the page, one of the elders answered, saying to me, what are these that are arrayed in white robes and whence came they? So where have they come from and who are they is really the question that's being asked here. And verse 14, the answer is given where he goes on to say, sir, thou knowest, um, these are they which came out of great tribulation, have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. So this is the group that come through a process and by which they're enabled to be part of this, this uh, fantastic scene in the book of Revelation and chapter 7 and, of course, chapter 14 as well. Now, what we'd like to do is kind of just step back a little bit and have a look at the idea of sealing in the Bible in general. 
So it's, it's this concept that is very much a biblical concept. It goes all the way back into the Old Testament, especially. And if we were to look at the word um, a seal, what is exactly does it mean? It's a sphragus is the word there, which is uh, a signet ring that has an inscription or an impression upon it. And in the Old Testament, um, the analogy is used by God in um, Job chapter 34, 38, sorry, in verse 14, where it says, it is turned as clay to the seal. Now he's talking about something else there, but you get the idea there of the, the clay that is being impressed by a seal. So if we were to just take this concept and just consider it for a moment, um, this, is, this is how it works. So we have scrolls, and of course in the book of Revelation is a scroll sealed with seven scrolls, and they weren't wax as is quite often depicted. That didn't come until around the fourth century. They were sealed with little blobs of clay. So the clay would need to be malleable, and you would tie a little knot and, and tie up your scroll, and then you would take your, your malleable piece of clay and you would push it onto the knot to kind of seal it, to kind of lock it in place so that it can't be undone and it would dry out. Um, and then you would take your signet ring and you would you would take that and you would push that onto the, the little blob of clay and you would leave a mark or a seal. And that would usually contain the authenticating name of the person who has put that together. So you take your ring and you seal it onto the seal. And that is the ring of the person whose document this is. And so when we look at seals, they're actually called boule uh, in, uh, in the archaeological world. Um, again, the seal is made of metal. The imprinted thing is made of clay. And it literally, boule is the Latin word for blob. And in Hebrew, uh, the plural is, is boule, and the, the individual word is the singular is bull. So here we have the boule of King Hezekiah, which has the inscription on it belonging to Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah. So this was the way that things were authenticated and they were used to. Uh, to prove that this document, this letter had come from the king or whatever important person it was. Now, let's just look in our Bibles back to uh, first of Kings chapter 21, because here we have an example. And there's, there's lots of boule that have been found. This one here um, was found uh, in, uh, in Israel. And um, a lot of them were found because the buildings that they were in, the scrolls that were rolled up there, the building was burned and the clay was hard fired. Um, like in a kiln almost, and so it survived, whereas all the documents were all torched, but the boule actually remained in place. Um, so in First of Kings chapter 21, we have an incident where a boule is used, a seal is used. So it's the, the, the story of Naboth and Jezebel in verse 7, Jezebel Ahab's wife said unto him, dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, so she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters to the elders, to the nobles that were in his city uh, dwelling in uh, with Naboth. And interestingly enough, this idea of, you know, writing letters in his name and it's Ahab's name and then sealing them with his seal. Well, they've actually found Ahab's seal. Uh, with the king's name upon it that was used to seal documents very much like this one that Jezebel writes. And in fact, further to that, they've also found Jezebel's seal um, in the Middle East, and there is a little clay uh, plasticine blob that it's been pressed into, so you can see the impression that it would leave. So in order to create these seals, things would have to be engraved. So we have engraving where something basically is going to have a message written upon it that then can be impressed on something else. Now, we typically think of engraving in terms of, you know, mementos, um, like a watch or a piece of jewelry, a locket or something along that lines, where we would have somebody's name engraved upon it, signifying ownership or conveying a thought or something along that lines. Well, when we come to the Bible, we find that there are also things that were engraved. So if you've got kings, just flip back to um, uh, Exodus, because it's in Exodus that we read all about engraving, but this has to do with the high priest. So if you come back to Exodus, and we want to look there at verse or chapter 39, in at verse 6, we find here that we have the high priest 
And um, we read that in verse 39, verse 6, they wrought onyx stones enclosed in ouches of gold, graven as signets are graven with the names of the children of Israel. So those, those two little uh, things on, the, on, his, on his shoulders, those onyx stones um, that basically um, the ephod would be upon, they would be engraven with the, the names of the, the 12 tribes. And then the individual stones also would be engraven. So in, in uh, verse eight, uh, just picking out of a couple of things there, the stones were according to the names of the children of Israel, 12 according to their names, like the engraving of a signet, every one with his name, according to the 12 tribes. So that's the idea, like the engraving of a signet, they were, they were inscribed upon. Um, so you could have the ability to, to press them upon something. Now, if you just come over to verse 30, what's interesting here just over the page is it's not just um, the breastplate and the, uh, and the, the, the two um, ephod, the, the little ouches that are on the top, but it's also the actual um, plate of gold upon his head. They made a plate of the holy crown of pure gold and wrote upon it a writing like the engraving of a signet. And what's written on there is holiness to Yahweh. And they tied it with a lace of blue and fastened it high upon the mitre as Yahweh commanded Moses. So again, it's written upon with the writing like that of the engraving of a signet or a signet ring. And what's written on there is holiness to Yahweh. So when we come to the book of Revelation and we, we have this idea of, you know, the 144,000 um, and they have a seal upon them or chapter seven, first of all, it's, it's picking up this idea of the holiness to Yahweh that's on that, that, throw, that, that crown that's upon the forehead. Now, if we go back to Revelation then in chapter seven, put this into context, I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels who were gonna go out and perform this judgment saying, don't do it uh, until we have sealed the servants of God, of our God in their forehead. So we notice that again, it's in their foreheads, just like it had been um, with the high priest that he would have that plate in his forehead. And so when you look at that and you say, well, what exactly was it that was sealed in their foreheads? Well, the answer to that is given to us if we come over to Revelation chapter 14, because here we have the same group. This time they are with the lamb upon Mount Zion. So Revelation chapter 14 and verse one, here we read, I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him 140 and 4,000 having what? his father's name written upon their forehead. So they are sealed in their foreheads with the father's name, just like the high priest was. So when you, you look at that, that is the goal that is taking place throughout the book of Revelation here is to write the name of the father onto the foreheads of all of the faithful. Now, when we take that concept, of course, it's, it's one that travels right throughout the Bible. Um, but there's a way in which it's done. So we just like to look at the signet ring for a moment because the, 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 the tool that is used to impress an impression upon the forehead or to seal the servants is actually the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the signet ring that's going to be used. Now, we'd like to go back and look at a prophecy that, that is about the Lord Jesus Christ in Haggai 2. So if we just turn back into the Minor Prophets, into Haggai, and we have here in Haggai 2 a rather interesting expression that comes up here, and it's, it's a prophetic one where he's talking about um, the future. He's talking about the Messiah. He's talking about what's coming in the future age. And so here we have in Haggai chapter 2, and at verse 23... In that day, saith Yahweh of hosts, I will take thee, O Zerubbabel, who becomes a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, saith Yahweh, and I will make thee a signet, for I have chosen, chosen thee, saith Yahweh of hosts. So here Haggai has told us that Zerubbabel, the governor, is going to be made a signet. He is going to be somebody who is going to be used to put an impression on people. And he says, I've chosen you for this purpose. Now that 
is a typical expression that points forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Brother Mark was talking about types uh, there in, in analogies, uh, allegories, and this is exactly what this is. Uh, the, the, the seal, the signet, is a type of somebody who's going to make an impression on the children of Israel. And that's what we have in Haggai. And of course, if we come over to the Gospel of John, that's what we see in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the signet ring of the Father, the fulfillment of this prophecy. If we come to John chapter 1, and at verse uh, 14, the one we're very familiar with, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, which literally means to tabernacle, to abide or to dwell. Um, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. So this is what God had done is he had taken the word. He'd made it flesh. It was their present tabernacling among them. And the disciples beheld his glory, that is the glory of the Lord, Jesus Christ. And what is that glory? It's the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So he is the proto, he is the tabernacle, the abiding place um, of the Lord's glory. And of course, when we think of that idea, it's, a, it's, it's much greater than this, and, and it's, it's the story of God manifestation where Moses asks God, I beseech thee, show me your glory. And when he rephrases that, show me your way, show me your, 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 you know, your, your being, so to speak, is what Moses is asking. And God turns around, he says, I will declare to you my name. And of course, he declares his character. And what we see here with the Lord Jesus Christ is the character of the Father in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we look at that, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Remember that the word was graven upon the tables of stone, but it, it wasn't just to be graven on stone. If we come over to Proverbs chapter three, the law, the word of God was not just to be written in stone. It was to be written in their hearts. That was the that was the goal of the father. So in Proverbs chapter three, in at verse one, we read there, my son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. The length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in Yahweh with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. So fascinating here, tying in with Brother Mark's class, where we, we see here they were not to lean to their own understanding. They were not to put their confidence in themselves, but they were to let God's word be written in their minds and in their hearts, and consequently trust in him, and in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy paths. And so if we come over to Isaiah in chapter 8, another little prophetic passage here, looking forward to the Lord Jesus Christ, we have an expression here um, in Isaiah 8 and verse 13. We read, sanctify Yahweh of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And it's fascinating where the Mark was talking about, you know, the, the title of that Isaac gives to God. Um, is the, the, the fear, or sorry, that Jacob gives, is, is that God was the fear of Isaac. And here we have, let him be your fear and let him be your dread. So there's got to be a respect there for God. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. And I will wait upon Yahweh, he that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. And behold, I and the children whom thou hast given, whom Yahweh has given me, are for signs and wonders in Israel, from Yahweh of hosts, which dwelleth in Zion. So here we see this idea of stealing the law among my disciples, and that I and the children Yahweh has given would be signs and for wonders. Now, that expression is picked up by the Lord Jesus Christ later on. Uh, it's in his prayer where he talks about those whom you have given me. None has been lost, save the son of perdition. So uh, we don't have time to go into that right now, but the I and the children are given. Yes, it's Isaiah, but again, of course, it does point forward to the Lord Jesus Christ, whose children are the disciples, the ones who follow him. But let's go over to Hebrews chapter 1. 
because here we have the idea expressed of um, the Lord Jesus Christ as this idea of a signet ring. So in, in Hebrews chapter one, we read here the expression that God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, and remember that was the expression there we just looked at, uh, you know, he was the word made flesh, and we be beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, right? So here is picking up that language, being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And that expression there is a fascinating one where it says express image, the Greek word for this is literally the word character, an instrument used for engraving or carving, a mark stamped upon an instrument, and the exact expression or the precise reproduction. So we think of that in terms of our signet ring. Our signet ring is an impression that's going to be made. So the express image is that word character, and the character is impressed upon something, and it leaves a mark behind. Now, all of you, I'm sure, have used a keyboard, right? So we have our keyboards, and on our keyboards, we have these characters that we press upon. Well, you know, we don't quite see them the same way that we did years gone by. In years gone by, with the typewriter I learned to type on looked something like this, and you pressed a key, and literally a character came up. It hit a little piece of ribbon, and that made an impression on the page, which was an exact replication of the key itself. So the character would strike the, the ribbon, make an impression on the page, and leave that behind. It was a replica of what was making the impression upon it. And that's what it says of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the signet ring, the character, the engraving mark that's going to leave an impression behind. Now, we also have this idea of the brightness of his glory. So the word brightness there, the reflective brightness, it literally means, um, it comes from the word apo, to come from, and orgazo, which is the idea of to beam or to shine, and therefore to shine forth, or the idea of the reflective brightness. brightness. So if we were to take a flashlight and we were to shine it on a mirror, we would get a reflection on the wall. It would cast an image upon the wall, which is going to be a replica of what is shined onto the mirror. So that's what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the reflective brightness of the Father, and that shines upon every single one of us as well. Now, follow this idea into Colossians. So if we just come back into Colossians. Um, we have there the same expression that's used, the same concept, really, that's, that's delineated there in Colossians. Um, and we want to just follow this through. It's Colossians chapter 3, and at verse 9, we're told, Lie not to one another, seeing you have put off the old man with his deeds, and you've put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. So remember, we were talking about two seeds, two ways of thinking. Well, this is the new man, and he is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. And so again, the word there, renewed, is the idea of to grow up, to make something new, to reinvigorate something, to give it strength and vigor, to change into a new life, as opposed to a former corrupt state. And it's renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now, the word there, image, is quite literally in the Greek again, the word icon. So we have icons today. We have uh, logos and, and icons that we see. If you're driving down the road and you see this logo or icon, immediately you get an idea from what this, this means. This double M or this golden arch in the sky means indigestion immediately, right? So we know exactly what it's all about. And that's the idea, a symbol, an icon is a symbol with meaning behind it. And so when we come to this idea of the seal, Brother Thomas in Eureka, volume three, wrote about this. And it's very helpful just to take a little bit of what he had to say. So he says the seal, 
was a symbolic seal that he saw talking of Ezekiel or sorry of, of John in, in Revelation 7 and represented something capable of making an impression upon the sealed. Seals were anciently, as in modern times, engraved with devices that when pressed upon a softened surface, the device might be transferred thereto as the mark of the owner of the seal. The deity has a device which he himself has engraved upon his own seal. The counterpart or mark of those is transferred to the hearts of those who are impressed and they become his sealed servant. So he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ here that's going to make an impression upon the hearts and minds of those who will receive that mark that are malleable, that can basically have this put upon them. And this is the seal. So from this, he goes on to say, we learn that sealing has to do with teaching and consequently, as a seal of the deity is applied to a surface capable of thinking, his seal is that which impresses his ideas or his thoughts and ways upon the brains of his creatures, right? So, so this is what God is doing through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is impressing his thoughts, his character, his glory, his way of thinking, my ways are not your thoughts, my ways and, and your thoughts are not my, your thought, my thoughts, he says in Isaiah 55. So this is what's being impressed upon the minds of the believers. And that's what this seal, the symbolic picture in Revelation chapter 7, is all about. So this idea of sealing the saints is one that has been going on um, way back in time. If you come back actually to Job, it's an interesting little expression that we see in the book of Job um, when God is, is talking to Job. Um, in chapter 33, he explains to him how he talks to men, right? So he says there in Job 33, verse 14, for God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. And how does he do it? Well, he says, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when the deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, then he opens the ears of men, and he sealeth their instruction, that he may withdraw man from his purpose, and hide pride from man. So here's the, the objective of God, is to redirect man. Man has his way and his purpose, which is not God's way. And so what God is going to do is write upon his mind, open the ears of men, seal their instruction so that they can be turned away from their own purposes and, and their own pride. So this, of course, is what we have in the New Testament. Come over to Romans chapter 12. We're very familiar with these verses, but now we put them into this context of the idea of sealing um, or leaving an impression or making a mark upon the mind of somebody it certainly makes more sense. So Romans chapter 12, and of course we have here in verse two, a verse we're very familiar with, be not conformed to the world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the process is the transformation, which is this idea of metamorphosis, so that we can be renewed or renovated or completely changed for the better. So changed from one form into another, made and changed for the better. So when we, we think about this, this is what God has been doing with us, um, with his people since the beginning of time. So if you come back to Proverbs chapter 3, and we have here this concept then of God not just writing uh, on stone, but as we looked at earlier a similar kind of concept in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 1. My son, forget not my law, let thy heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee, bind them about thy neck, write them on the table of thine heart. So this is the goal, is to write these things on the table of our hearts, impress them in our hearts and our mind. Well, how does that take place? If you come over to John chapter 17, and this is really um, the, the process of sealing. Uh, we could have renamed this phanerosis or God manifestation, because that's really what this is all about. So John chapter 17, we have the process by which God writes upon the table of the heart and how we are then redirected in our understanding. So in John chapter 17 and at verse 17, the Lord says in his prayer to his father, 
sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified through thy truth. Now, when you think about that, what was impressed upon the high priest's forehead? Holiness to Yahweh. Holiness, which means to be sanctified or to be set apart. So this idea of having the Father's name written upon the forehead, holiness to Yahweh, the tool that's going to be used to do this is, of course, the truth. The truth, right? And it's not just truth in an esoteric sense. It's the truth, the truth of the gospel, the truth of the kingdom, the truth of the word that we have. And that's why we as Christadelphians put so much uh, emphasis and, and, and effort into this idea of, of, of sorting out the truth and trying to get to the bottom of things. And so when you think about this idea of, of writing the, the Father's words upon our minds and our hearts, it really is not about academia, right? So when we say doctrine is important, sanctify them truly, it's not academic doctrine. It's, it's taking that doctrine, distilling it, and then writing it upon our hearts so that we are motivated by it. Our thoughts are now God's thoughts because we've adopted them. Our ways become God's ways because we're going to walk the way that he is telling us to walk. And it's the sanctifying word of truth that's going to help us do this. And we, we know this. We, do, we take our, our friends, our interested friends in the seminars to Matthew 22, right? Where we, we look at that passage about the tribute money. Matthew 22, we have there um, the, the temptation of the Lord. And there, there's, you know, do you pay taxes or, or not? And so he says in Matthew 22 and verse 19, show me the tribute money. And they brought him a penny. And he says, whose image and superscription is this, right? Whose is it? Well, of course, it's Caesar's image and superscription. They say Caesar. So then he says, render to them, uh, therefore, unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but unto God the things that are God's. Well, what is God looking for? He's not looking for the money that is impressed with the head of whether it's Queen Elizabeth or Abraham Lincoln or whoever it might be is the, the, the dominant power over your country. That's not what God is looking for. You can give that money to Caesar and never mind about that. What he wants is to have his image and his superscription written upon our hearts. And, and that is done through the gospel messages we're going to see as we, we travel through this, this series on, on the sealing of the servants of God. So if you come out of Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul in Romans 1 points this out. He's, he says in verse 15 um, that he's ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. And he says, look, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It is the sealing agent it is what is able to write the Father's name in the foreheads so that we can be part of those who are, as we read in Revelation chapter 7 and chapter 14, those who have been made worthy, not through their own merit, but through the precious, precious blood of the Lamb to stand with the Lord on Mount Zion. They've come out of great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white. And they're, they're with them at Lamb upon Mount Zion. And they have the Father's name written upon their foreheads. And this is the process that we go through. And it's the process of baptism. So if we want to be part of this, and, and young people, this is specifically sort of geared to us, that this is what God wants us to do. So out there in, in the world, Everybody wants to write upon your brain and on your heart, right? The schools want to write upon you. The media wants to write upon you. But God wants to write upon you. He wants to write his word upon you. And the qualifier, um, the, the sign or the symbol of, of accepting that is baptism. So if we come over to Matthew chapter 2 and uh, down to verse, sorry, Matthew, Acts chapter 2 and at verse um, 37, here we have the, the words of the, the, the Jews too, the, the apostles as they were day of Pentecost, speaking every man, everyone heard them in their own tongue. In verse 37, here we have Peter, when they were asked, you know, by the Jews, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter says unto them, repent 
and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises unto you and to your children, to them that are far off, and as many as the Lord our God shall call. So this is it. The spreading of the word of God, the power of God unto salvation, is then translates into repentance, people understanding this is what I've got to do. I've got to change my way. My way is not your way, and my thoughts are not your thoughts, says God. So we have to adopt his thinking and his way. And the way that we show that is through baptism. And so we then have the sealing of the Holy Spirit. Now, for us, it's the power of the word today to transform our minds. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit further in a future class, but that's that's what's going to go on. It's the transforming of their minds and their hearts so that they become part of that class of people. Now, you're in Acts. Um, let's go over to chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, we see this process being worked out. Here we have Crispus in Acts chapter 18 and at verse 8. He is the chief ruler of the synagogue. Well, he believes on the Lord with all his house. And as many of the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized, right? So here's this process. They heard the word of God. Hearing it, they believed it. And then consequently, they are baptized. So there's a process. Faith comes from hearing, hearing from the word of God. And that faith has to translate into action. So they believed, they faith is what the word literally means there. And once they faith, they then put that into action and they are then baptized. So if you come over to first of Peter chapter three, we see here that part of this process for us is that we show, we put our seal, we agree with what God has done, right? So we think of uh, uh, Jezebel sealing with the seal of Ahab. So she, she puts his name to this letter. But when we get baptized, what we're doing is we're putting our names to the, the, the promises that God has given, and we're saying we agree with what God has said and what God has done. So it has an effect on us. In, in 1 of Peter, in chapter 3, and verse 21, we read, the like figure that whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So baptism now saves us, right? It's a figure. And again, Brother Mark was talking about this. It's it's an antitype, right? So this is the idea of, of it's, a, it's something that has a lesson that is tied into this. And this is what is going on with us, that baptism is us signing up to this whole concept. And so young people, it's imperative um, that you yourselves choose this. Your parents can't choose it for you. We don't baptize babies. Um, that's something the Christadelphians don't do. We do not baptize babies. It's your choice whether you want to do this, not just to go into the water of baptism, but every single day. Am I going to listen to what God said? Am I going to let him impress his word upon my mind? So the like figure of baptism now saves us. And it's having that good conscience because the word has been impressed upon our brains. And so if you come back over to first of Corinthians or second of Corinthians, sorry, in chapter one, um, we have the same concept again, that God is writing upon us. Uh, with his spirit word, and uh, and this is the process that we're currently going through. So 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and at verse 21, he which establisheth us with you is in Christ, and hath anointed us is God, who hath sealed us, and giving us the earnest of the spirit in our hearts. So God is the one who seals us, and the word there to give the earnest of the spirit literally means the idea of of a down payment, right? So it's something that a money that's given in a, as a pledge or a down payment, the full amount will be paid in the future, but right now we have this down payment. And so this is the idea is that we, we hear the word of God and it makes an impression upon us. In, and the disciples in the first century were given a taste of what's to come. They were actually given the Holy Spirit as well and were able to perform miracles and so on. But that's, that's another subject altogether. So come over to Ephesians chapter 1. And here is, here is what the apostle now talks about um, 
with this whole process that's happening for all of us. It's the idea of getting the word impressed into our minds and into our hearts, like that, that seal upon that little blob of clay. So in Ephesians chapter 1 and at verse 13, we read there, um, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. So the idea of trusting here is believing the word of truth, which they heard. So remember, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It's the gospel of your salvation in whom after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest or that down payment again of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So they were given a taste of it in the first century. They were given the power of the spirit, but that sealing process um, is, is what was going on impressing unto the minds and the hearts. And so consequently hearing this, the word of truth, which is the gospel of salvation, which is the power of God to salvation, is able then to, to transform the mind and make us uh, part of the, 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 the process that God has been working on all along. So this is what God is trying to do. He's trying to take that, that word, the word that he has in the Lord Jesus Christ who embodies this, and he's impressing that onto our minds and our hearts. Now, what we have to do is we have to receive it and we have to agree with this, and we have to, in a sense, set our seal to it. Now, this comes up multiple times. You don't have time to look at them tonight, but you think of Darius, um, Darius and, and his lords, right? So when Daniel was put into the lion's den, um, Darius is bound by the law. He, he made this pronouncement. He now has to see it through. So he seals it with his seal, and all the lords that are with him now have to set their seal to it also. They also have to agree to this. Now, the same happened with Nehemiah. When they reconfirmed the covenant, they all set their seal to it, saying, we agree with what has happened. And it's incumbent on us to set our seal through baptism to basically say that we agree with what God has said. And that is, young people, what you're doing in the process of baptism. You're agreeing with God, what God has laid out. Now, if you come over to John chapter 3, and we look at this idea in verse 33 of John chapter 3, we read this. He that hath received his testimony, this is the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and those around him, hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God speaketh or giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. The father loveth the son and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son have everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. So this is the idea, is that if we, we hear what God says and we grow up going through Sunday school and CYC and, and our parents have taught us these things, and that's what they believe. And, and you know, you see this, there's people in the Bible, like Saul we've been reading about in our readings, he talks to Samuel and he says, oh, pray to the Lord, your God. Well, young people, God has to become not the Lord, your parents, God, or your Lord, uncle so-and-so's God. He's got to become the Lord, your God. And when you get baptized, you are taking your seal and you are saying, I believe what God has done. And I am setting my seal to this. I am agreeing with this. And so he that receives the testimony has set to his seal that God is true. We have, we have put our mark on that, say we agree with what God has said. We believe, therefore we're baptized, and consequently, we're given eternal life. And so we need to sign on, so to speak. And this is, this is the imperative that's there in front of all of us. Now, come over to Song of Solomon. Um, in Song of Solomon, um, we find here this, this idea, this idea of setting our seal to something. Um, Song of Solomon and it's chapter eight. Song of Solomon is a little bit difficult sometimes. It's this poetic language and it's really talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and his bride. But here is what it says there. Um, he set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave, the coals thereof are coals of fire which hath the most vehement flame. So 
in context, what this is talking about is it's saying, look, the love that the bride has here and that of her, her husband, which is the Ecclesia and the Lord Jesus Christ, is like a seal upon um, thine heart. Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. So in other words, God wants that impression to be right in our hearts, not just written in a Bible that sits on a shelf, not just something that sits on our desk and, you know, every now and again, we blow the dust off of it, but it's got to be written in our hearts, right? That's what he's looking for. Set a seal upon thine heart and a seal upon thine arm. It's got to be in what we believe and, and where our hearts are and also in the things that we do. That's the process that God is trying to do. And that's what we're reading about in Revelation chapter seven. I'm going to come back and look at Revelation seven uh, through this week. Um, but that's what's happening. However, in the world we live in, especially, there are some unsealing agents. There are things that prevent us um, from being sealed or erase the impression that is upon us. Now, when we, we think of this, um, I, I'm just going to cite this one to you. It's, it's Isaiah 64 and verse 8. Now, O Yahweh, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou art potter, and we are all the work of thy hand. So this is the thing. We are the clay and we are the work of God's hands. Now, I spent a lot of time in high school at a potter's wheel. Um, we had to take this class about health is what they called it. Um, and instead of thou shalt not commit fornication, it was how to commit safe fornication, quote unquote. So um, Uncle Daniel Billington and I, we opted out of this class. Um, and we said, this is against our principles. We're not going to go in there and learn about all the revolting things that you want us to learn about. Um, so we were consigned to make pots in the pottery room for about eight weeks. So I made a lot of pots during that time. And the thing is, is that as a potter working a pot in the clay, you can see his hands, they're very wet. They're moist. And so the way clay is, is worked is it needs to be wet. It needs to be worked with the water getting in there and made malleable. And you have to keep adding water to it through the whole process of making this pot. If you don't have enough water, all of a sudden the pot will just start wobbling on the wheel and off she goes and it's no good anymore. And you have to recompress it all and start all over again. Well, this is the analogy that God uses, you know, that, that God is the, the potter and we are the clay, we are all the work of God's hands, right? So if you want God to make an impression on your heart, if you want to be part of that 144,000 symbolically in the book of Revelation, with the Father's name sealed upon their foreheads, part of those who go into the kingdom of God, then you need to apply the water of the word daily so that you can be malleable and usable to the Father. So come over to Romans chapter four, because in Romans chapter four, we have here the, the, the reverse of this. Like we can be malleable and we can be workable, but we also have things that can make us not workable. So we're told here, despisest thou the riches of his goodness in verse four, Romans four, and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. So what God's done with the work of the Lord Jesus Christ should lead us to repentance, to want to change our minds and our hearts. But after the hardness and impenitent heart, we treasure up to ourselves wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So we, we can have a choice. We can either be malleable or we can have a hard and impenitent heart. Now, this, heart, this idea of hard is obstinate, stubborn. The word literally is scleros, the idea of to stiffen. And we have diseases today, sclerosis, which is a hardening. We have neurosclerosis, a hardening of the nerve endings. Uh, muscular sclerosis. Um, and so we, we, we become hard and it just doesn't make an impression on us. And we become impenitent. And the idea of, is, is admitting no change of mind. We become unrepentant. We are not interested in letting God work upon us. And, you know, young people, sometimes that's how we feel. We, we do. It's our flesh. And we feel like, oh, you know, I really just don't want to go to meeting or I don't want to do the readings or I don't want to 
I mean, I want to be in the kingdom of God, but all the other stuff, I'm just not so sure about it. If you're feeling that way, it's probably because the word of God is not getting in. And if you come over, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In 2 Corinthians 4, if the power of God to salvation, which is the gospel, is not penetrating, it's not making us malleable so God can form us into a good pot, but rather we're more like those broken shards that you can see that are dried out and kind of useless. You can't really do anything with them. If that's the case, it's probably because we've had just a little bit too much of the world baking on us. So if you come to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and in verse 3, we read here, if our gospel is hid, it's hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, that impression should shine upon them, should, should make a, a mark upon them. So if that's not working, if the gospel is not getting through to us and we're just feeling like, oh, I'm just not really that, it's probably because the God of this world has blinded our minds. And the word there, blinded, is to flu, which literally means to blunt the mental discernment or darken the mind, right? So that's what's happened, is the things of this life end up blunting our minds. It's put slightly different just over the page in, in Ephesians chapter 4, but the same idea is there. Verse 17, I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, the empty wastefulness of, of people around us, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance of that or ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all greediness or uncleanness with greediness. So these are people who are have a vanity in their mind. Their minds are devoid of truth. Not only that, they're depraved. They're without strength. They have no purpose in life. And so they become alienated or estranged or shut out because of the ignorance, the lack of knowledge, moral blindness that has taken place that has made them calloused. And that's what that word there being past feeling is to be calloused. So we have to do a bit of an attitude check. What are we doing with our minds? Are we allowing our minds to become calloused? Um, are we allowing things in our lives to darken our minds, draw our attention away from the truth so that God can't impress his seal upon our foreheads? Are we maybe, you know, being made apathetic um, because, you know, uh, I'd rather do this or I do that than I would have the word of God make an impression upon my mind? And so we have to ask the question, do I want to go to Bible class or meeting or lecture or Sunday school or CYC and engage in the sealing of my mind with the impressing of the word of God upon it? Or do I not want to go? Or do I go just because, well, I have to go. It's just a ritual. You know, well, this is where we've got to decide we want to own this. Do I want to do the readings or do I just do them out of duty or do I not do them at all? Um, or am I too busy, you know, having a TV and internet and games and social things make an impression on my mind instead because I just don't have any time for the word of God? If my mom and dad are not around, would I, would I do them myself? Um, if I was traveling for work, which I had to do a lot, did I do them myself? So the question is, do I want my mind to be sealed with the word of God or not? And that's really a life uh, decision that we have to make. So come back over to 1st of Peter chapter 1, because this is where we really have to decide what do we want out of life? And that's what Bible schools are all away, all about, is about a, a, a recalibration, a redeciding of, of what do I want to do with my life? So in 1st of Peter chapter 1 and verse 13, we're told, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So gird up literally means remove all the impediments from your way. Get these things out of the way. So, so in the Old Testament, when they would run, they would take their garments and they would tuck them into their belt so that they their legs were free, that they could run freely. If you're finding stuff in your life is tripping you up, get it out of the way. You know, not 
uh, fastening ourselves as obedient children, not fasting ourselves according to our former lusts. And the word literally means conforming our minds and our hearts to what the rest of the world does. But as he which has called you is holy, so be you holy in all manner of conversation, which means our lifestyle. Purifying ourselves, right? Because it is written, be holy because I am holy. And remember, that's what the plate that was put upon the high priest's forehead. Holiness to Yahweh, right? So that's what he wants out of us. He wants us to be holy. So just let's close up with our, our minds going to the first letter of John. Come over to first of John. I'm going to read this actually from the Diaglot. So have it open in your Bible and you'll, you'll notice some differences in on the screen. Um, but in the Diaglot, in first of John chapter three, this is what we read. Dear children, let no one deceive you. As soon as he says that, you know that we are liable to be deceived. So he who practices righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. So we either practice righteousness, this is who we are and what we do, or we do something else. Verse eight, he who practices sin is of the enemy. For the enemy, which is the flesh, has been sinning from the beginning. For this was the son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the enemy, the flesh, right? So we go on to read verse nine. No one who has been begotten by God practices sin. Why? Because his seed, the word of God abides in him and he cannot sin uh, because he has been begotten by God. So this is the idea is that we are being begotten by God and that's going to determine how we're going to act so this isn't some intellectual thing it's god manifestation it's not intellectualization it's not a bunch of facts it's about putting these things into action uh it's it's not the the saying it's the doing of these things and so john continues by this are the children of god discovered and the children of the enemy so we're going to be either one or the other we can't be foot in both worlds no one who does not practice righteousness is of God, and no one who does not love his brother. For this is the message that we have from the beginning, that we should love each other. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one and killed his brother, on account that what he did, uh, why did he kill him, he says? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. So have no wonder if the world hates you, because we know we have passed from death to life when we love the brethren, he who loves his brother or loves not abides in death. So when we look at this here, this idea of sealing in the forehead is about taking what God is trying to impress upon us, his character, his mindset, and preparing our vessel to receive it, removing all the encumbrances, all the things out of the way, making sure the water of the word is there so he can make that impression upon our minds and our hearts so that basically Come Revelation 7 is when I look at it in our next classes, um, that impression is going to be made upon us and we're going to be made fit for the kingdom of God because when he comes, he will see in us a reflection of himself. Thank you very much.